we're back again with Jay Johnson, and uh, we're in your scale house. Is that right, Jay? This is the scale house. Uh, I want you to walk us through step by step, because I'm amazed at the technology that you've got just here in the scale house. And that's kind of the theme that we want to follow through with the rest of the operations. We take it chronologically from grain arriving here. So take it from there, Jay. Okay. What we've got here, Mark, is the screen here shows the uh, probe. And you can see the truck has untarped. You can see the corn in the trailer there. And what we do here with the probe is, go ahead, Cindy, and we'll turn on the vacuum and stick the probe down into the truck. And as we pull that up, you can hear the corn and see the corn coming into the vacuum box. This probe will the vacuum box will suck the corn in. It's about 300 feet. And then we will swing around and we probe both hoppers. So did you already buzz, Cindy? No, he's coming up. Here. Okay, get the probe up. Okay. Uh, one thing, a lot of times, we've got a buzzer on there, but a lot of times the driver gets impatient and will uh, pull on up. But anyway, you're supposed to probe both hoppers. Comes into the vacuum box. Then the and what we're doing here is we are testing for um, moisture of the corn. 15-0 is, uh, is the moisture that it needs to be. Otherwise, there is a discount above 15-0. 15.0 mean 15%? 15% moisture. That's correct. You're going to see this as it tests the moisture here. We're also checking for test weight. Okay, that's 12%, so that's fine. Anything under 15, now we do accept anything over 15%. However, it needs to be uh, conditioned to 15%. We have so dryers. So we store that someplace else on the facility here. That's correct, we would store that. Today it's going directly into the train. Because okay. it's dry corn, we can put it directly on the train. The trains have to be 15-0 when they leave here. We're seeing another truck pull up here, which gives you a sense of how quickly things happen. Now this, the truck that was just probed is now on the scales and Kathy here, Cindy was probing, and Kathy is now entering the information for this truck. She will enter the vehicle ID and the holler. Okay, normally the trucks do not, our hours every day in the off season are 7 to 4.30. Normally uh, the truck driver stays in the truck and doesn't come in and we have a stoplight which we can go out and look at here. But as soon as she gets him weighed, which he's got a, a weight on of 77,080 pounds, you're allowed 80,000. So he's within the tolerance there and uh, she sends him to the, to the pit. We have three dump pits. and. Uh, I think we need to show you the stoplight and the uh, dump pits and how all that works. Okay. Uh, before we move on here, I see that there's a scale on behind me as well. That is correct. We have, uh, we were probably one of the first in the industry to put in two scales. Uh, that just enhances your speed and your efficiency because you can put the loaded trucks on one scale and the empty on the other scale and therefore you don't have the trucks using the same scale. Okay, which can create a bottleneck because you've got, uh, if you can imagine trucks coming in one way and empties coming out the other way and it just, it, it wastes a lot of time. Okay, looks like they're waiting on us. You can go ahead and start the next one if you want there. Jay, how do you determine, how do you make sure that you've got a steady flow of grain trucks arriving here? Well, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we're just, whenever they come, we dump them. Uh, when we do not have a train, it goes into storage. So whenever the trucks come, we dump them, and uh, during the busy times, we do create a little bit of a line. So, are you ever contacting farmers or grain elevator operators? Can you send us some shipments on this particular day? Absolutely. If we need corn, we'll uh, we'll put out a, a, a bid for that uh, time frame uh, that will entice some selling. And if we don't get the selling, then we start calling around to see what it takes in order to buy corn to satisfy our uh, outbound shipments. So, this might sound like a pretty obvious statement, but you're purchasing this grain from these local elevator operators and the farmers? 
That is correct. And so there's negotiation every time you do that. Huh? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. How much is this grain that you're uh, going through here right now? What's the, the purchase price that you're paying for a bushel? Right now, uh, the futures are around seven thirty, and we're about uh, forty under. So about six dollars and ninety cents is what the farmer would get, okay. or the or the country elevator. And you figure 950 bushel, that's, uh, uh, that's over $7,000 for a load of corn. Huh? And I know sometimes that she actually uh, smells the corn. You're looking for a particular aroma then? Yes. Uh, the great factors, like I mentioned, moisture is 15-0. Damage, you're allowed 5% damage. Damage would be, uh, you know, molded kernels or uh, some sort of dam other damage. Uh, you're allowed foreign material, you're allowed 3%. Okay, that's the industry standard. Foreign material would be like fine or cracked and broken kernels that would fall through a screen. And then the odors you're looking for would be uh, either musty, which is a musty smell, a sour smell, or uh, what they call COFO, which is a, a foreign odor. COFO is foreign odor. We see very little of that. Uh, if corn was put away too wet, uh, and not enough air on it, it can develop a musty or sour smell. And you can dry grain if it comes in here too moist? That's correct. And what do you do with the sour grain? Then? We will also dry it to get to get rid of the smell, okay. or we will air it, uh, put some air on it to, if it's not too bad to get rid of the smell. Okay, excellent. Um, let's go ahead and shut down here and we'll pick it up outside. Those are the damaged kernels right here. See that? Yeah. And then what she's doing is shaking for foreign material. Show them what the foreign material. See, that would be the fines, the foreign material that gets discounted if it's over three. Then you pick the damage out, like these damaged kernels, you pick that out and you weigh it. And you see if it's above 5% or not. If it's under 5%, it's fine. That's what the industry allows. Okay, we just had the uh, next grain truck pull up. Uh, Jay, tell us what's going on here. Well, right now they're weighing the loaded truck on the inbound scale. You can see right now on the stoplight it's red. So they just weighed him and it's sending him to pit one, which we have three pits. So he's proceeding to pit one and then the next truck will come up, get probed, get weighed, and go dump. And this particular part of the operation takes just five minutes or less, right? That, that's minutes. correct. And right here you've got the uh, readout that uh, goes to zero here and when the truck pulls on it can see what its weight is so it knows what its weight is and um, this uh, whole process from start to finish takes the truck about four or five minutes to dump pretty efficient Wow! and how many trucks on an average day do you move through here depends on the time of year uh, harvest time uh, our record was uh, 900 around 925 trucks in a day and in the off season especially in the summer it's slow so today we'll probably dump uh, 200. That still sounds like a lot of corn to me. It is. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and uh, head on towards the, uh, the main operation. Okay, it looks like we're uh, ready to start again. Javi, you could tell me what's behind you here. Well, this is the uh, entire shuttle operation with storage and uh, dryers, uh, the train loading, you can see everything happening. We've picked a good day because uh, we usually load one to two trains a week and we do have one today, fortunately. What we've got here is, uh, you can see these tanks over here that say Balin on them. The ones on the, our right. On the right here, B-E-H-L-E-N. We've got five tanks, bins, we call them, all Balin bins. These two bins here hold 100,000 bushel each. 
The bin over there holds 125. Those are our wet holding bins. Okay, we hold wet corn in there before it goes to the dryers. The dryers, there's two on this side on the far right. The taller ones? The taller ones. There's two there. There's one behind the other. And then over on this side, and those each dry 5,000 bushel an hour. So there's 10,000 bushel of drying capacity on this side. And that big dryer over there on the far one, the tall one, dries 10,000 bushel an hour. What do you use for power? Is that uh, natural gas you're using that or what? Propane. Propane. Yeah, we're on propane. Uh, we've got a propane tank right on the other side of these rail cars, and we've got another one right over here, the white propane tank over What's, on that side. What is the long shed, the huge shed you've got? That is a storage building. We hold 7 million bushels of corn in that building. And uh, we'll uh, take a walk out there and uh, look in that building. Uh, inside that building, you can hold five football fields. Wow. Seven million bushels of corn. Okay, we got another truck coming by here. We'll wait for that to pass. Jay, can you tell us just a little bit about the construction of this facility? We started construction in October of 2003. We dumped our first load of corn March 17th of 04, and we loaded our first train April 19th of 04. When we started construction, we did it in phases, and we had enough built so we could start receiving grain in March, which was only about a six-month project until we were dumping grain. Prior to October of 03, there was nothing but corn and bean fields out here. This was completely built from scratch. The road, the blacktop road coming up, the scale house, all of this construction, the fertilizer business, which is uh, Lemon Ag, which Lemon Ag leases property from us and has his own fertilizer business. So all of this has been done since uh, October of 2003. Did the, uh, uh, the rail line actually supervise the construction of the spur coming in here then? The rail, uh, we had specs that we had to meet and they gave us all the specifications. We bid it out with the specifications that the uh, rail, the Burlington Northern Santa Fe required, and uh, we hired their crew to build the railroad. And how about the main contractor? Is there companies that specialize in, in building these facilities? Yes, there are. We had about uh, eight or nine companies from all over the Midwest that were interested in uh, bidding the project, and uh, we uh, selected uh, Metroplex out of uh, north of uh, Peoria, Illinois. Uh, to do the uh, building and construction of the rail. Okay, um, I guess we're on again. We've got a truck pulling up. Uh, and uh, Jay, go ahead and explain to us now what's going to happen here. Okay, we just left this scale. The truck comes out to one of three dump pits. This is truck pit number one, truck pit two, and truck pit three. We dump in different pits based on the moisture content, the damage content, the pouring material. We both hoppers at the same time. These hopper bottom trailers have two hoppers and if you swing over here you can look at the uh, corn coming out of the first hopper. And this is just an inherently noisy job, isn't it? Yes it is. Especially with the train being loaded today. You hear that in the background, the corn is spilling into the train. I imagine that's the sounds that you like to hear though. We, as expensive as corn is right now, we we like to buy it, but we also like to sell it. So all the trucks come in and dump the dump in the pit. We'll put it in storage or put it on the train and ship it out. And uh, rail 500 semi loads at a time down to Texas and Mexico for cattle feed. I wonder if we can pan around and catch uh, the loading operation behind Jay here. And Jay, tell us a little bit about that. Okay, what we've got here is. Uh, We've got a mile and a third loop track. This train's 110 cars, and the loadout spout right here is filling the rail cars with corn. Once it reaches the weight, which there's a barcode on the side of the car, which reads the proper weight, and it weighs up exactly the amount of weight that you need to fill that car, that car legally. So as we, each rail car made up of three separate hopper compartments. So we're dumping into the third compartment 
on it. Well, actually in the middle, moving to the third compartment. As soon as we're done dumping in the third compartment, it'll send the next order for the next car. Now, 110 cars in a typical train that comes in? 110 cars is a train that comes in, and it takes us about seven hours to load. How many engines to pull that monster? Four engines. All four are in tandem? Four engines in tandem, yes. Okay. Anything else we need to know about it right here? Well, let's go in and look at the control room here. Okay, great. Jay, we've gone inside now. Exactly where are we in the operation? Okay, this room right here is our control room where we control the uh, dump pits and all of our uh, equipment going to the grain bins, and it's also where we grade our trains when we're loading a train. If you film over here on this uh, sampler, uh, Don, will you open that up for us and show us what you're doing there? This is actually what we just looked at up above with the spout filling the rail car. A certain percentage, there's a, an arm that swipes corn as it's coming by and will send the sample down in here. Now, as we showed you the grading on the way in and how we discounted up there, the same applies to the outbound shipment. So Don and Jessica here are uh, working for the Decatur Grain Inspection, federally uh, regulated. Uh, so they come here and check the quality of the corn going out to make sure that the buyer is getting what uh, what they're paying for. So Don, you want to run that through the uh, shaker here. Right now we just dumped the corn in the shaker. What that's going to do is check for FM. As we had that tray up there that we shook and we showed you the, the broke, broken, cracked corn and the fine. This right here will shake the corn and it will pull the you pull the fines out and Donnie will show us that here in just a second. You call that FM? For, yeah, the foreign material. It's foreign the, material. The uh, cracked and broken and, and uh, fines and tips and uh, that fit through that screen that we were talking. There's screens in here. About got it done. Well, I'm interested that the two people you've got in here are not your employees, they're federal employees? Okay, you got this. All right, right here would be the corn material, cracked and broken corn. And most of that just looks like um, fragments of corn and nothing that's else. That's correct, yes. But that's considered foreign material? That's considered foreign material, yes. And okay. again, it's to determine a percentage of that? Yes, you're allowed 3% on foreign material. And you asked the question about uh, our employees. These are, uh, we are not allowed to have our employees grade. They have to be federally licensed inspectors. So we have uh, contracted with the Cater Grain Inspection to uh, do our grading of outbound shipments. Okay. So they work on your schedule, but they answer to somebody else. <laughs> That's correct. And okay. they do a, an absolutely magnificent job of uh, working uh, nights, weekends, uh, I think that's the uh, way the business goes, and they're here when uh, when we need them. Excellent. So works out well. Okay. Anything else in here, Jay? Yes, I'd like to show you here the the controls. Uh, as you can see, the bins, the grain bins that I talked about, the five tanks that we have. This shows the grain level in all of the bins. It shows the equipment. Anything in green is running. Okay. So as you can see, this pit number one, right here, truck pit number one is green, it's running, and it's dumping corn into a grain leg, which elevates the corn. It's got buckets inside of it on a, on a belt, and it elevates the corn. Then there's a series of valves up here that can all be done 
by a touch of a mouse and then directs it into the grain bins, okay? If we follow the flow here, this truck is dumping into leg number two, it's coming over here, and if you follow the lines, you'll see that it's coming right down into the bulk weigher, into the rail car. And this right here is the bulk weigher that uh, weighs the corn. This leg right here, we're pulling out of grain bin 30, because it's green, grain bin 20, green, coming over into this grain leg and coming, and if you follow the lines, it's coming into the bulk layer as well. So we're dumping the trucks and pulling out of the bins, all going into the train. Okay, and the people at Control House are controlling both sides of this operation, both the grain that's being dumped from the, uh, the trucks and the grain that's being loaded in the rail cars? From this room, yes. Okay. Well, there's a lot going on here then. Yes, and we do have a gentleman upstairs who do actually does the loading. These computers work simultaneously. This, when we're dumping, we're down here, and when we're loading, we're upstairs, but it's the same control from both places. And so he's controlling everything from upstairs today. Normally, we'd be down here okay. running it from this location. So these two employees here aren't actually controlling the loading of anything. It's just no. the testing. Just, just testing, yes. Okay. Well, let's go on to the next step here then, Jay. Okay. We'll go upstairs. Jay, we're in the next step. Why don't you go ahead and pick it up from here? Okay, right now we're in the loading room, and uh, Pete is loading the train here. And uh, like we explained down below, you've got the cars that are read by a scanner. It tells us what weight we need in the car, and right now he's dumping the corn into the rail car. So okay. I see our uh, computer screens, the same things we saw below. The only difference is this is identical to what we saw below, so he's controlling everything from here today since we're loading and this is the loadout side which is only controlled from up here that is not downstairs because this is where you need to be to load it shows the corn coming into the first hopper then it goes it feeds down into a scale which is weighing it right now and the middle parts of scale and then it drops you into the bottom hopper here and that's what feeds into the rail car so it weighs eight, nine, or ten drafts in that scale to get the total weight that we need for that rail car, depending on the size of the load that the car calls for. How long does it take to load a rail car? Pete, what do you say, about three minutes on a rail car? Uh, three minutes or better. Okay. And you say there's two hoppers in each rail car? Three. Three. Mm -hmm. Our quickest time is two minutes and 54 seconds. Two minutes and 54 seconds is the fastest. Okay, cool. And the fastest train is about uh, six and a half hours. I gotta tell you, Jay, this is kind of a moving experience up here because I feel the building vibrate as we stand here. If you think about the weight that's being supported in this room right here, you've got the tower that we're sitting on here, the structure that is holding up the entire bulk wire system with that corn okay, dropping go. down through there. So there's a lot of weight, so you do get a little shake. Yeah, and a little movement here. Uh, I'm sure that's all part of the engineering standard because you got to factor all of that in and wear and tear over the years. Absolutely. We've loaded 260 some trains since we started and uh, we're still going strong. Now these other operations you were talking about that Burlington uh, with Burlington Northern's Santa, Santa Fe, Fe. Um, are each on the same scale operation as you have here? The, uh, they all vary. They've all, the requirements are that they can all load 110 cars and they can all do it in 15 hours or less. So all of them are set up to do that. We probably load as fast as any of them in the state, and we've probably got more storage than any of them in the, in the state. So I'd say uh, we're, we're, you know, as far as storage and, and time of loading, we're, we're, uh, we're right up there towards the top. Do you have a sense of the geographical area that you serve that, of people who are delivering grain here? Depends on the time of year, but uh, most generally we pull corn from a 30-mile radius. That doesn't seem like a lot. But it doesn't seem like a lot, but there's a lot of cornfields. There's in a lot of 60 corn. Miles. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, anything else in here, Jay? I think that'll do us for now. Okay, let's move on to the next step. All right, Pete.
Jay, we got you standing next to this sign here. I uh, wanted to ask you just very quickly, uh, the nature of the relationship between you and your father. Are you now the, the uh, president of Johnson Shuttle LLC? Yes, my father, uh, like I mentioned earlier, started the grain business in 1975. And in 2003, uh, at his age and being semi-retired, he uh, didn't want to undergo this larger project. So uh, I am the majority uh, owner and my father and uh, Carol Carafa, my father being Robert Johnson, and Carol Carafa, one of our outstanding employees that's been with us for 30 years, is also a minority owner. So I would be the president and uh, my father the vice president, and uh, Carol would be our uh, uh, corporate secretary. So the weight of success or failure is on your shoulders then? Well, that's, yeah, it sure is. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, quite an undertaking, but uh, things have gone very well so far. And we're hoping that Mother Nature provides us with another good crop this year. Outstanding. Well, let's move on then. Obviously in a different location. Jay, we're on the train now. Why don't you uh, take it from there? Okay, we've got Jerry German here driving the train. He's our engineer. And uh, what he's doing right here is uh, he's got a radio. And uh, when the loader, Pete, we showed you the load room here a minute ago, tells him to move forward, he'll pull up to the next hopper. And uh, we'll load each of the three hoppers, and then we'll move on to a next the next car. So right now he's waiting for his command to move forward and as soon as he does uh, what he's got his right hand on there is the throttle so he's gonna throttle it forward here and move to the next uh, compartment in the car so Jerry is your employee I take it Jerry is our employee yes and what happens to the, the train crew when they arrive here the train crew comes in, leaves the train. Uh, they have a shuttle service that picks them up and takes them back to their post in uh, uh, Beardstown, uh, which is about an hour west of here. And then uh, our guys come. We have three train loaders. We have uh, Jerry, uh, Ralph, and Wayne. And then we have two train loaders, which would be uh, train drivers, Jerry, Ralph, and Wayne and Dave Gein, there's four of them. And then uh, train loaders would be Pete, who we talked about earlier, and David Moose, and then Wayne also loads some and also drives, so. And the train loaders are the people who uh, work in the control room there? That is correct. And most of our train drivers are uh, retired uh, individuals that can meet the schedule, because uh, you never know when the train's gonna come in. It can be uh, nights or weekends. And uh, Jerry's a, a farmer in our area and a good friend and uh, used to uh, operate trains in the military. Is that right, Jerry? Yep. So yep. Jerry's had a lot of experience, so we're glad to have him on our team. This uh, loop we're on, they said, was a mile and a third? Yes. 7,200 feet. 7,700 feet of track. And uh, it's coming right off the, the main rail line for BNSF? Yes, it comes right off the main line and we've got a, a switch on both, uh, going both directions so the train can come on or off from either direction. Uh, tell us a little bit about where this train's destination is then. This train will go to, is this a Mexico or a domestic train, Jerry? This, going Herford, this one's going to Hereford, Texas. Uh, about half of our trains go to Mexico for feed and the other half go to uh, Southwest or it'd be West Texas. Uh, this one's going to Hereford, Texas, where there's some huge, uh, huge cattle lots down there in Hereford. I guess that's different than the old days when they used to drive them north to feed them off, and now they're being done down south. Yes, they've got a lot of herds down south now, and they, they sit on some nice aquifers for uh, water supply, and we take them to corn. And uh, what Jerry's doing here is uh, probably, probably the most desired job. Everybody wants to to drive a train, and especially my kids. I've got uh, 
If uh, Jerry, if you could sound the horn for us, can you sound the horn? Yeah, you got the horn and bells, and I've got a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old. My 12-year-old uh, Haley uh, loves to drive the train and toot the horn, and uh, my nine-year-old boy, uh, he loves it as well. So kind of the most popular place to be is right here in the engine. A lot of fun to be able to operate this much power, isn't it, Jerry? Yes, it is. Yeah. About 13,000 horsepower. 13,000 horsepower. In one engine, they're all of them together. Forty-four hundred apiece, all of them together. Okay. And most generally, we have four engines, which is, uh, I guess, it'd be over seventeen thousand horsepower. Is that right, Jerry? Right. Yeah. Do your uh, Do you see your kids following you in the business, Jay? <laughs> well, you know, it's one of those things I was talking about earlier. I didn't figure out what I wanted to do, and. Uh, until I was almost out of college, and I think uh, my kids at this point in time probably think this is too much work also, but uh, I think they'll find out like I did that there's there's no better place than uh, when you grow up in the country to, to return to the country and return to your family and your friends and agriculture. So I hope that they'll that they'll play a part in this uh, one of these days, but too early to tell right now. This is certainly a far cry from where you started out, from where your dad especially started out, being a tenant farmer and having a little bit of diversity in the farm. Can you talk a little bit about how farm life has changed? Yes, the farming operations have gotten much larger, and that's what's made this possible, is, is the amount of uh, volume and, and the speed at which we can dump uh, really attracts the, uh, the modern day farmer. and. Uh, like I mentioned, how my father started out in 1975, and and uh, a lot of credit to my to my mother and father for uh, having the uh, foresight to begin the business, and then uh, uh, by doing that, allowing me the opportunity to uh, to further that and and uh, make it uh, make it what it is today. Uh, do you see this kind of what What do you see for the future for farming? Let me put it that way. The future for farming, uh, we're going to continue to uh, see larger and larger farmers and fewer of them. And uh, it's going to uh, turn into a corporate uh, business. And it, it already has, and it's going that way. But you're seeing farmers that, uh, that are becoming more and more advanced uh, with knowledge and management, and uh, that's going to continue. The good and the bad of that trend? Well. Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, uh, you can't go against progress, and uh, there's, uh, you know, the, the, the good, the good uh, progressive, uh, uh, good managers are, uh, are doing things more efficiently. And uh, I think in any business, that's what you strive for is efficiency. And uh, the ones that are smaller, that are efficient, uh, I think will continue to survive and, and could, could grow in this environment. So I think it's just turning more to, into a corporate business and you've got to be able to uh, to manage uh, and be efficient in order to survive. Um, and your piece of this, uh, are you, uh, it seems to me you're at the innovative edge of what's going on with the grain processing and grain shipping and grain transmission. transmission. Yes, uh, starting in uh, 2003 when we built this, we were probably one of the uh, most uh, efficient, uh, technologically advanced facilities uh, being new and a lot of them being older. Uh, there have been some newer ones built here since then that are, that are equal or even maybe a touch uh, more advanced than we are. But uh, we're definitely on the cutting edge of, uh, of the technology and it, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty neat to, to see how it all works. Is that why you were named the uh, Small Businessman of the Year a couple years ago? <laughs> well. I'm not quite sure how all that came about, but uh, I was nominated for the uh, Springfield District of Small Businesses, and and uh, there were several districts in the state uh, that uh, had nominees, and I was fortunate enough to be selected the uh, Businessman of the Year for 2007. And what was really neat about that is got to represent Illinois and uh, Washington D.C. for uh, Small Business Week in Washington D.C. and. Uh, was fortunate enough there to uh, to be the first runner-up behind uh, 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 business from uh, North Carolina. What was the North Carolina business? Uh, there were two uh, gals, two females that were had started a hospice center and had several hospice centers across the state of North Carolina and 
several thousand employees and had shown just a ton of progress and a lot of growth and profitability and uh, providing uh, employment opportunities and that's a lot of the criteria they looked at. Uh, but this is no small operation yourself, how many people do you employ? We will employ uh, between full-time and part-time about 35 uh, and uh, that's uh, grown from about uh, 10 three years ago and uh, I think that uh, there will be a need to continue to add as, as we continue to grow. Where do you see the business 10 years from now? Well, I hope that uh, we're still moving as many trains as we are and I hope that uh, Mother Nature is good to us and we have good crops and, and I hope that our markets in uh, Texas and Mexico continue to be good for the farmer. Uh, this has been a, a great uh, situation for the farmers to be able to uh, have this market right in their backyard and uh, has enhanced their uh, grain prices uh, because of that. So I hope that we can continue to do what we're doing and I hope it brings value and as long as it does bring value to the, to the farmers and local elevators, I think we'll be doing just what we're doing and uh, hopefully on a larger scale. Any final words for us as we uh, kind of finish this off? Well, um, appreciate the time you spent today. I uh, hope that uh, this has been beneficial and uh, wish all the success to the Lincoln Library. And um, we're looking forward to, uh, to visiting ourselves. And, and seeing the end product, no doubt. You bet. I've been, my intention is, uh, I've been listening to the radio, listening to the radio from BNSF, and they've got a half mile of track somewhere over along the river just causing all kinds of delay yep. this train is sitting over there has been sitting for over 12 hours Can't okay what uh, Jerry the driver saying and he's not Mike so I don't know if you can hear that or not but the uh, what he was saying is is we've had a lot of rains and uh, we've had a uh, uh, some floods along the Illinois River uh, here in the last uh, three or four weeks and that has backed up the trains and uh, there uh, was a half a mile of uh, railroad track washed out down by the Illinois River, which has caused a lot of congestion on the railroad. So as we have seen a lot of, uh, we've been very, very pleased with the, with the performance of the Burlington Northern Santa Fe. And uh, right now, uh, due to Mother Nature uh, and the uh, floods, uh, the service has not been that great, but understandably so. The interesting comments, I would think that the barge traffic has certainly been disrupted as well on the Mississippi, and that's been the alternative way to get grain south, is it not? Absolutely. Uh, the entire uh, movement of grain has, has been affected, and that will happen from time to time. We've seen the, uh, the rail lines are generally more reliable uh, because you don't have to deal with low water or high water like they do on the barge, so the rail system is, uh, is definitely more uh, reliable from that standpoint, but when we have a, some track get washed out, I guess it doesn't. Uh, you it, just can't argue with Mother Nature. That's right. You? There's somebody else in charge. Now, before we were pessimistic about the notion of getting inside this storage shed, is that a possibility now with the train where it's at? Yes, it is. Okay, let's go ahead and finish off in there if we could then, Jerry. Yep, okay. that'll be fine. All right, thank okay. you, Jerry. You Appreciate it. This is our uh, 7 million bushel flat storage building. Uh, we built this, uh, started building this in uh, 05, added to it in 06, and added to it again in 07. Uh, it's now 750 feet long, 330 feet wide. In this building, we've got an automatic fill conveyor that runs across the top, fills the corn, drops the corn down, all the way 72 feet high, slope down to the wall. We have also a reclaimed tunnel. You see this hole right over here? There's a tunnel down underground that has a conveyor in it that will clean the corn out of here. So we pull the entire center down, 
and then we, when we get that pulled out, then we start augering it to the center to get the rest of it cleaned out. And that's all the noise you hear is all of the conveying equipment pushing the corn and moving the corn to the center so that we can get it out into our bin storage and eventually load it on a train. Uh, I think uh, I said before, 330 feet wide, 750 feet long, five football fields inside one building. So it's a uh, it's a rather large uh, complex. And the maximum storage capacity? Pardon maximum me. Storage capacity? Seven million bushels. Seven million in this one facility here. In this one building under one roof. And the key of this whole business is knowing when to store it and knowing when to sell it and when to move it, huh? You gotta be, uh, you gotta be on top of things in this business and, uh, and know all the, uh, all the, the, the different, uh, aspects of the trade and, uh, work hard. Well, Jay, you've got a wonderful story here. You've done a great job telling stories, so I want to thank you very much. It's been our privilege to hear it. Thank you very much.